Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, hope, yeah. Have, hope everyone had a good weekend. Uh, we are getting close to the end of this uh, vector calculus module. If you haven't gotten tired of it yet. Um, so last time we spent a lot of time going over how to do uh, plotting in Python. I, I hope you find that hope you found that helpful. Like I said, uh, Python is a very important programming language right now, and being able to do data visualization is extremely important uh, because I think that it's going to become more important than MATLAB going forward. Um, and for the purposes of this class, uh, knowing how to visualize uh, vectors and vector fields and things like that are very important. So today what we're going to do is uh, we are going to continue and uh, go over in detail the different types of orthogonal coordinate systems. And um, then we're going to get into um, the line integrals, surface integrals, divergence theorem, and Stokes theorem. And that will be the end uh, of this module. So uh, just to give you a preview, uh, surface integrals is when you, when you integrate a vector field over a two-dimensional surface. And related to that is this idea of surface flux and the divergence theorem. Then we're going to talk about line integrals. Line integrals are when you take an integral of a vector field along a particular line in three-dimensional space or two-dimensional space. And that is related to something called circulation or the Stokes theorem. So uh, I hope that we get to all of it today. Um, if not, we'll, uh, we'll get to Stokes theorem the next day. So um, let us uh, go over the questions first. Um, help me with names. I'm still learning names. <laughs> Nor? Yeah. Okay. Nor had some questions on the homework. Uh, for number seven. So for number seven, a is homework. a di is a divergence. Take the divergence and plug in the points. Homework seven uh, a. Okay. Let's look at this. So the question on homework 7a was, given a three-dimensional scalar field, uh, t equals 2xy minus yz plus xz, defining Cartesian coordinates. The question is on uh, part a. Suppose I am at point 2, negative 1, 0. Which direction should I go to get the maximum increase in t? Give the answer as a vector. All right. OK, so uh, tell me what your specific question was on this one. Is it just a divergence and plug in points? Uh, the question is it the divergence uh, it's not the divergence it's it's it is something we discussed in class though so let's go over the three uh, there's gradient divergence and curl right let's uh, let's talk about this right it is a gradient but let's just remind ourselves what's the definition of the three what is divergence nor what is the definition of divergence Scalar. It's a scalar quantity, that's right. And just flux. Exactly. You got it. You got it. Divergence of a vector field is a scalar quantity that measures how much the arrows of the vector field go away from a certain point. And it's you're right. You, you stated in a more succinct way, which is it's the outward flux from any given point. That's right. Um, so now what is the definition of the gradient? The gradient is the Which step you take to, to maximize the slope points to the, to the slope? Right. Which has like the greatest slope? Uh, That's right. Greatest slope. That's right. The gradient, the gradient vector points in the direction where you're going to get the maximum increase in in whatever that scalar field is. So the way that I like to imagine is, let's say I have a three-dimensional field describing temperature at every point in this room, okay? This room is a three-dimensional space. There's a function that describes the temperature at every single point in the room, okay? Wherever I happen to be, the gradient vector is going to point in the direction I should go to get the maximum increase in temperature. So if there's a heater over on that side of the room, the gradient vector is going to point this way. It's going to point in the direction I should go to get the maximum increase in temperature. All right, and we talked about uh, a unique situation where if um, if there's no increase in temperature, let's say I go anywhere in this direction and there's no there's zero increase in temperature, then the gradient at that point is equal to what? 
Zero. Zero. All right. If there's no direction I can go to get an increase in temperature, then the gradient is basically zero at that point. All right. So this is giving that you know that kind of example. Just imagine that T is temperature and you're, it's defined in three-dimensional coordinates. And you're at a particular point. What direction should you go to get the maximum increase in T? So the hint I'm going to give you here is, is utilize the gradient of the field. And then that will actually help you with part B as well. Part B is suppose I move in the director, direction specified by A. What is the rate of increase in temperature? The gradient vector also tells you that. It tells you both. All right. Um, the last part, I just want to make a note on part C because we did talk about this in class. We talked about partial derivatives, but I want to make sure that you all understand this. So, so if I go in that direction, I'm sorry, not, not in that direction. So A and B have to do with the gradient. Okay, that's the hint I'm going to give you there. Part C is, is a different question entirely. I start at the same point, but now it's saying I move in the Z direction. So what's the rate of change in temperature if I go in the Z direction? So I'm here in, X, um, in XYZ space. I'm in this room. There's some kind of temperature gradient defined by the room. So this is Z, this is X, this is Y. Okay? So this question is telling me is that if I move in the Z direction, how quickly is the, is the temperature going to change if I move in this direction? So how would we figure that problem out? Exactly. You guys both got it. You take the partial derivative of the, of the function with respect to z. That's exactly right. So if I walk in the x direction, similarly, if I walk in the x direction, and I want to know how quickly is the temperature going to change if I walk in this direction, I think about the partial derivative in the x direction. In the y direction, similar. What if I chose an arbitrary direction? What if I say I'm going to walk in the 45 degree angle in the vector, in the vector that's like uh, 1x plus 1y? So I'm going in this direction. Would you take partial derivative of What's that? Partial derivative of You have to take what's called the directional derivative. Okay, we didn't talk about the directional derivative in this class, but it's, it's a pretty straightforward concept. You take the gradient, you first calculate the gradient, and then you take the projection of the gradient in the direction that you want to go. Okay, we talked about gradients, we talked about projections, all right? So if you want to if you want to have the if you want to figure out the rate of change in any arbitrary direction, then you take the gradient and you project it onto the direction that you want to go. Okay, that's not what this question is asking. This is just asking the z direction, but I just want you to make you aware of that. All right? Um, yeah, you have a, a questions here where you're going to be asked to calculate the gradient of the scalar fields and the divergence of the scalar fields in cylindrical and spherical coordinates. So we're going to be talking about that today so that you can uh, turn and be able to complete that for your homework on Wednesday. All right. So without further ado, let's uh, let's get in that. Are there any other questions before we start? All right. I'll check in on the people who are logged in here. Um, um, let's see. Falak and Bilal, uh, do you have any questions you would like to ask? All right. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to talk about the or, uh, orthogonal coordinate system. Um, I remember, like, uh, uh, some of you had worked with spherical and cylindrical coordinate systems before, and many of you had not, right? Okay, so we should make sure that we go through this in, in detail. All right, we'll start from the point that we're all familiar with, okay? We all know about the Cartesian coordinate system, and... We'll begin with that. All right, the Cartesian coordinate system, as we know, x, y, and z. Uh, but there are uh, two additional coordinate systems that we can use as well. First of all, why do we need additional coordinate systems? There are certain, um, we're going to be doing certain problems in this class. Point source, uh, a wire source. Uh, these things have like spherical symmetry or cylindrical symmetry. So for example, if we have a point in space, if we have a point in space and we have a point charge, you know, we said the electric field is defined as the distance away from that point charge. What type of symmetry does that system have? Spherical, Spherical right? You can imagine that the electric field, when you think about does a system have uh, symmetry or not, here's, here's one way you can think about it. I'll just draw this out here. And, you know, I'm speaking the obvious here, for so, but it's just, it, 
it's it's an important thing that you just know very methodically how to do this because there are other coordinate systems as well. In this particular case, we have this point in the middle, and we were we were saying that the electric field is proportional to one over r. Um, we covered that in the module one. So depending on how far away we are from this particular point, so this radius r at an observation point p, the electric field is proportional to one over r. So it's only dependent on r. So it has this sort of symmetry everywhere the electric field everywhere on any given sphere or is uh, going to be the same right it's just a function of r so if i drew another sphere here like the second one that i drew here everywhere on that sphere the electric field is going to be the same so this is an example of spherical symmetry All right, so we take another example, also that we covered in Module 1. Um, even in these other coordinate systems, I often draw the x, y, and z axes, because that's something that we're all familiar with, all right? And it helps orient us in a three-dimensional space. So this problem that I just showed you would be done in spherical coordinate system. And the one I'm going to show you now is an example of cylindrical symmetry but we still draw the x, y, and z um, space just to orient ourselves. So this is an example of cylindrical symmetry. All right, and what it was was this example of the, the Bios of Art Law where you had a wire, you had a current going through that wire, and the Bios of Art Law basically stated that the electric field, here, let's just draw this in red the electric field goes around like this. It goes around that wire. Okay, so the way that you can think about this system is that you have um, the cylinder here. Your wire is a cylinder, right? And uh, in this case, in this example, it was an infinitely long cylinder. Right? And the, uh, the field lines, the magnetic field lines, go around it. So in this case, B is, was proportional to 1 over R, if you remember the formula. And this R is just the radial distance from the, the z-axis. So this is the distance from the z-axis, all right? And whereas this one here was a distance from the origin, all right? So you can see from the, you can see immediately that there's a two different types of symmetry here. In this type of symmetry, everywhere, uh, in the first example, everywhere on a particular sphere, which, which is described by the distance from the origin r, it has the same electric field. Here it's a little bit different. This is the distance from the z-axis. So I'll just draw this in a different color here. Everywhere on a cylinder. So I'm going to draw out the, the cylinder like this. And my drawing's terrible, which is why I rely more on the graphs. But everywhere on the surface of a cylinder, you have the same magnetic field. Right. So this is an example of cylindrical symmetry, where r is the distance from the z-axis. Right. So it's important for us to understand which of the coordinate systems works uh, really well. And just to, um, you know, just to give everyone a, a sense of where Cartesian is useful, is the basic problem that we have here. You know, like the where we say, what's the electric field in between two parallel plates? like this. You know, we put a voltage across here, you get positive charge on this end, and then negative charge on this end, the classic system. Your electric field vectors point in the downwards direction. So at any, um, at any point, at, at any line um, x, um, well, this would be like y equal, oh, sorry. Let's put another one. This is we're drawing the um, 
This is the x-coordinate, this is the y-coordinate, and this is the z-coordinate here. Right, so anywhere along this line, let's say this is z equals 0, all the electric field vectors are the same. Um, and for this particular case, even along, let's say, z equals l, the electric field lines are the same everywhere along, uh, along that z equals l. So this is an example of Cartesian symmetry. So for each one of these situations, I'll just write this down here, Cartesian So whenever you do a problem in electromagnetics, the first thing is to just decide what, uh, what coordinate system you're going to use. And I, I think most of the time it'll become fairly obvious to you uh, which, which one is most appropriate. Um, there may be some situations where you might, have, you, you might uh, find that it's, both will work, but it's easier to use one versus the other. All right, now in order to be a coordinate system, you have to have three unit vectors that are perpendicular, mutually perpendicular to each other. Mutually perpendicular means you have a unit vector in one direction. So let's say this is u1. u2 has to be 90 degrees. And then u3 has to be also 90 degrees in, in the third dimension. All right, the way that I've drawn it, it's a little bit you know, it's a little bit hard to see, but you imagine that these vectors are in three dimensions. All right, so you, so you imagine, the best way to think about this is to do the right-hand rule. We talked about one kind of right-hand rule where you basically give a thumbs up, right? And your fingers are curling around in one direction. There's another type of right-hand rule where you, you point your first finger in one direction, you point your middle finger in one direction, you point your thumb in the other direction. These are three mutually perpendicular vectors, right? Mutually perpendicular means you could take any combination of two vectors and they're always going to be 90 degrees to each other. That's the definition. All right, um, so we're going to talk about each one of these systems in turn. The first we're going to talk about is the Cartesian system. This is going to be obvious to you, but it's a good way to just get our, you know, make sure we're all on the same page. We're going to use the same methodology for the uh, cylindrical and the spherical coordinate system. So in the Cartesian coordinate system, you have obviously have you can describe points, and then you can also describe vectors. In terms of points, like a point describes a location in a three-dimensional space, um, and the, the location of the point is described by x, y, and z coordinates. Now, if you're describing vectors, as we have done in a lot of the examples that we've done, there are three unit vectors. You can have, a, if you have a vector in a Cartesian three-dimensional space, a three-dimensional vector that has an x component, a y component and a z component, it's three components. All right, so a typical vector might look something like this. You know, a equals three x hat minus two y hat plus uh, five z hat. You know, just a random uh, random vector there, right? Um, so it has these three components, x and x hat component, y hat component, and z hat component. And what are these unit vectors? They, x hat always points in the direction of the x-axis, y hat points in the direction of the y-axis, and z in the direction of the z-axis. They all have a length of 1. Remember that. Unit vectors always have a length of 1. Okay? Um, what else can I say about this? Um, not much, because I think you all are familiar with, uh, familiar with this. We'll talk about the differential areas in just a second. This is a Cartesian coordinate system. Cylindrical coordinate system. Uh, we have three different coordinates, just like before, three mutually perpendicular vectors. But now they're in the cylindrical uh, uh, symmetry. So as I said before, we still draw the x, y, and z here. Uh, just to give us uh, our bearings in a three-dimensional space, but we don't use those three, court, um, well, we don't use the x and y. We do use the z, because the, the three coordinates in the cylindrical coordinate system are r, phi, and z. So a, any point in three-dimensional space, like you can have a, a point in three-dimensional dis space described by x, y, and z, we know that. You can also describe a three-dimensional space a point in three-dimensional space by r, phi, and z, three different coordinates, where r is the radius, so 
the radius I'm going to put on here is the distance to the z-axis. Okay. So if we're talking about this point in space here. All right, r is this distance here, the shortest distance to the z-axis. Wait, so you could say, well, what about this? Like, you know, this is also a distance to a z-axis. Yeah, but that's not the one you want to use. The one you want to use is the shortest distance to the z-axis. The shortest distance would be to go straight to the z-axis, and the mathematically it's defined as when there's a right angle to the z-axis. That is the shortest distance from this point to the z-axis. So let me um, erase this one. That's not the one we want. So we want to use the shortest distance to the z-axis. All right. Um, now, so that's the first coordinate. The question so far. All right. The next coordinate is phi, which is called the azimuth angle. What we mainly refer to uh, re refer to it as phi. And that is the angle from the x-axis, and that must be between 0 and 2 pi. So the way to think about this is think about polar coordinates. Um, if you remember the polar coordinate system, I'll draw that up here. The way you're familiar with that one is imagine that you have, you know, in a two-dimensional space, how you have your x-coordinate here, your y-coordinate here. Okay, and if you're trying to describe a point in two-dimensional space, you describe it in terms of two values. You, you give it an r. So you have your r right there. And then you also, have, you also describe the angle from the x-axis. So the phi is this right here. Right? And we can draw a little triangle here like this. Okay. So if you want to convert from cylindrical to um, from polar coordinates to uh, x and y coordinates, you know, we can use this these formulas. x equals r cosine of theta. And then y is equal to r sine of theta. Right, and this is your x and this is your y coordinate for the point. All right, so a point in space can be described by x and y. It can also be described by phi and r. All right, yeah, question. What's theta? Theta is the angle right here. So what is phi? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Apologies, I'm, I'm mixing up my variables. I said theta. Phi, let's, let, this angle is referred to as phi. My mistake. Thank you. So what's the formula for phi here in terms of y and x? What's the formula for phi in terms of y and x? X over r inverse cosine. Yeah, uh, y over x, an in inverse tangent of y over x. So um, let's remind ourselves here. The tangent of phi equals y over x, right? So phi is equal to the inverse tangent of y over x. Uh, Question. Uh, multiply the angle, is it tan negative 1 over uh, minus 1 over s? Minus 1 over s? Mm -hmm. Minus negative 1 over then, yeah. That's for the Cartesian. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is just a, a tangent negative 1 of y over x. Right. Yep. Okay, so these are some of the trigonometric relationships you want to just remind yourself of. You, just, you guys probably remember some of the stuff from... Uh, some of the stuff from uh, earlier when you've looked at this. But it, this is the relationship between polar and uh, Cartesian coordinates in two dimensions. Now, when we get to the cylindrical coordinate system, we're just adding the z dimension. 
the Z dimension in the Cartesian system is identical to the Z dimension in the cylindrical system. So let's get back to this then. The first, um, the first point that describes, uh, the first variable that describes our point is that R is the distance from the Z axis. This phi is the azimuth angle from the X axis, so that is shown here. All right, so from the X axis we measure this angle phi. And I've shown you an example of that in two dimensions on the right here, so that you can see more clearly. And then the third, uh, the third dimension is a z, the vertical coordinate. So that is simply going from z equals zero up to wh whatever the height is. All right, so you notice that the r vector, this r hat vector, the phi hat vector, and the z hat vector, is they're mutually perpendicular. Do you see how they're all 90 degrees from each other? That's, every coordinate system must have three mutually perpendicular unit vectors. All right, but here's an important difference. Here's a very important difference between these two. In the previous example here, x hat, I'm going to circle x hat, y hat, and z hat, okay? All three of these, they're always pointed in the same direction. x hat is always pointing in the direction of the x-axis, y hat is always pointing in the direction of the y-axis, and z, is, z hat is always pointing in the direction of the z-axis. Notice in this example here, in the, cylindric, in the cylindrical coordinate system, and as we'll see in the spherical coordinate system as well, r hat the direction that r hat points is actually depends on what point you are in space. If I was here, for example, if I was at this point in space, then my r hat vector is going to point in this direction. And my phi hat vector is going to point in this direction. Yeah, absolutely. In this coordinate system, z hat is the only vector that stays the same. It's always pointing up, regardless of what point you are at in space. So that's one of the interesting things about the cylindrical and spherical coordinate systems, that the unit vector, the direction that the unit vector points, actually depends on what point you are in that space. Okay? And why are they pointing in different directions? Well, r hat always points. If, if you take, if you um, if you draw this line r, okay, the the line r is going from the shortest distance from the z-axis to the point in space. So, um, you know, this I'm just trying to try to highlight it. There we go. There we go. Yeah. So this point, this line here. All right, the way that r hat points, it just points out in the radial direction, okay? It points outwards from the z-axis, okay? And then the phi hat, the phi hat points in the direction of, uh, along the tangent of the circle. You see how phi hat is tangent to the circle? So in, at this point here, the phi hat points in this direction, it's tangent to the circle. Out here, phi hat points in this direction, it's always tangent to the circle. All right, just, I wanna, ma I wanna make, sh make sure this is clear because I see some, still see some shaking heads out there. All right, I'm gonna draw this is the top view, so you have your x-coordinate and y-coordinate. So I'm drawing a two-dimensional polar coordinate space right now. Let's say my point out here is P, okay? The way that I describe that point P in, in uh, polar coordinates, to think about this circle, there's a radius, and then there's this variable phi. All right, this is the angle here. All right, r hat, the r hat unit vector points in this direction. It points in the radial direction, and the phi hat vector points in this direction. All right, so when I'm saying that it's, it's perpendicular, it's tangent to the circle, 
right? You, the circle goes around like this, and the tangent line means you're running along the edge of the circle, and the r-hat points in this direction. So you have a 90-degree angle between the two. Okay, and the z-vector comes out of the page here. It comes out of the screen. Oh, did you guys want to copy that down? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so any questions about the directions of these vectors? All right, we're just building this up from fundamentals. Here. Okay. All right, so let's uh, go on to the next coordinate system then. Uh, the Z, as we talked about, it's a vertical coordinate. All right, now the spherical coordinate system, this gets a little bit more complicated. You notice we have a radius. There's three coordinates that describe a point in the spherical coordinate system, R, theta, and phi. So we added this new variable here. This phi is, um, this theta is called the zenith angle, and it must be between zero and pi. I'll go over that in a second. And then we have this, which we saw before in the cylindrical coordinate system. That's the azimuth angle. That's the angle measured from the x-axis, and that must be between 0 and 2 pi. So let's write this down here just so we're all totally clear on it. The zenith angle is the angle from the z-axis. So notice we're not using the distance from the z-axis anymore like we did in the um, we did in the cylindrical coordinate system, so um, this the second coordinate here is the angle from the z-axis. The third one is the angle from the x-axis, and this one up here, as I mentioned earlier, but I'll, I'll just say it again, is this is the distance from the origin. Okay, all right, so let's, uh, let's look at this diagram and see how it works here. All right, so we have this point in uh, three-dimensional space. So let me just put this on the laser pointer here. So this is our point in three-dimensional space. Everyone see that, right? Okay, now um, this is going from the first coordinate. Let's start with the first coordinate, the r. So every point in space has a distance, oops, distance from the point to the origin. So that's r. Okay, you can see the r vector here. So this is the distance between the point and uh, the origin. And the origin is this point in space here. All right, notice that the uh, r hat vector points in, um, in the direction of radius. Okay. All right, the second, the second one, this is the one that, that the students often get con confused on. The difference between the, the cylindrical system and the spherical coordinate system is the zenith angle, all right? You're actually describing two angles. One is the zenith angle, which is measured from the z-axis, and the other one is the azimuth angle, which is measured from the x-axis. That's this one here. All right, so think about that for a second. This point in space, you, could, you already have an r. Now what I want you to do is just imagine that r vector the r vector is the angle. Imagine changing the angle of this r vector and bringing that back to the z-axis. Right, so you're tracing an arc like this. If that makes sense. All right, the angle, the angle of this arc is your theta one here. All right, so it's kind of like having two polar coordinates instead of one polar coordinate. One, one of these polar coordinates is, is, the, is the angle from the z-axis, and the other polar coordinate is the angle from the x-axis. All right, so you notice these two angles here, the, the uh, theta one and then the phi one. This is from the x-axis. So, you know, one of the important parts about this is you can think about this in terms of the angles 
But let's also consider the range of the angles as well. Um, if we go back to our previous slide, in this type of cylindrical coordinate system, what is the range of the angle phi? Zero to two pi, right? The reason is because zero is, yeah, exactly, a one revolution around the circle. You got it. So two pi is one entire revolution around the circle. Now, one of the interesting parts about a, um, a, cylind uh, a spherical space is that we can go, we can reach any point in, a three in this three-dimensional space with a zenith angle of just between zero and pi. This is not two pi. Notice the zenith angle says between zero and pi. The azimuth angle says between zero and two pi. That might seem a little bit confusing at first, but can anyone tell me why the zenith angle, it, it's sufficient for the zenith angle to only go between zero and pi? It doesn't need to go between two pi. Yes? Because all that happens in the space gets decided by, by pi. You got it. So yes. Right on, right on, perfect. So, um, what, remind your name again? Hamza. Hamza. As Hamza said, like this three-dimensional space can be described, like you can, you only need to go between zero and pi in the z-axis, but the azimuth angle, the x-axis, will allow you to access any point around this entire circle. All right, um, if it helps, I'll just draw this out. Um, We'll just draw this out again here. All right, so let's say I have a point out in space here. That's the one that was shown on the, on the previous slide, or on the slide th that I just showed you. So for this point in space, we would measure out, the first thing we would do is we'd start with R. Okay, this is your R. The next thing we do is what is the as uh, the zenith angle? So we just figure out this is um, our zenith angle. And I made the mistake again. Zenith angle is theta. So that's this angle right here. So here's our r. We have the theta. All right. The way we think about that is that we think about this r forming an arc like this. So this distance here is also r, just so we're all aware. Okay, so that is the theta angle. All right, and let's say this point is out all the way over here. So this is the x-axis and this is the y-axis. So we are gonna take the same uh, radius r, okay, and we are going to imagine that there is a, um, a circle here like this. I'm going to draw this in a different color so you can more easily see. I'll redraw that. It'll be a little easier for you to see. Imagine that there's um, a circle that's like this, oriented just from that point. Okay? And so from here, we take the x-axis, the x-axis is going in this direction, so this is x, and then there's an angle here. This is your phi angle, okay? Does this make sense to everyone? Imagine this as a circle here, and so this is your phi angle, and so the point, the, the, the azimuth angle of that point is the angle from the x-axis. So you're just making like a, a half circle? Ah, yeah. So getting back to that question now. So we have these two coordinates. The phi, um, the theta describes the angle from the z-axis up here. And then the phi angle describes the angle from the x-axis. So if you go from 0 to pi, that will cover half of the circle, right? So from 0 to pi, so here is z equals pi down here. All right, that allows you to access this half circle. 
So any point in space you could be described by this half circle. But the point that Hamza was making is that if you want to access a point in this space, something to the left, you can do that in the same um, with the same coordinates. So let me erase this, erase all these. So let's say I now have a point on the left. You might say like, well, with if I only go from zero to pi, how can I access this point here? Well, you can do that because you still have a zenith angle with this. So you have your distance r here like this. This is also r. You have your angle here. This is your theta angle. And, but now your, uh, your phi angle is going to allow you to access the left side of the axis here. So our phi looks like this. You draw a circle from that point. Draw a little circle around the z-axis. And so this is the x-axis here. We measure the angle all the way around to this point. Right, we measure the, this angle all the way around. So our angle here is going to be something like, it's going to be over, uh, more than 270 degrees. All right, so even though our zenith angle only goes from 0 to pi, the fact that uh, we have the zenith angle and the azimuth angle going from 0 to 2 pi, that allows us to access any point in a three-dimensional space. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. Kind of. What's your question? No, no, I see it now. Like, uh, the, z, uh, the zenith angle like, is half pi and then it wraps around. But, like, it makes the sphere. I'm not. Like, I'm visualizing how it makes the sphere with the two angles. Yeah, I, I think what you're suggesting is a good way to think about it. The, the zenith angle going from 0 to pi draws a half a circle, right? right. It draws a half a circle, but you take that half circle and you rotate that half circle all the way around 2 pi, you get a sphere. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good way to think about it. So if you all didn't get that, like think about think about how do you create a, a spherical volume. You take you can start from your zenith angle at the top here. I'll just draw this out again. If I want to be able to access any point in a three in a three dimensional spherical volume, I can take um, I can take go from z, z the zenith angle from zero to pi like this. All right, so this is the angle here is equal to pi. And if I take that uh, that half a circle now and I rotate it in the azimuth direction, zero to two pi. I take that half circle and I rotate it around 2 pi, then I get a sphere, right? So that allows you to get uh, a um, cover every point in a spherical space. Yeah, thank you. All right, so the, we have the unit vectors r hat, phi hat, and z hat. They or, or originate from a specified point. They are orthogonal to each other just like before. Um, r hat points in the r direction this uh, um, theta hat is tangent to the, the arc in the zenith direction, and the phi hat is tangent to this arc in the, um, in, in the azimuth uh, direction. Ah, so let's talk about the differences between spherical and cylindrical. Well, let's talk about the differences between Cartesian first. Um, again, I'll, I'll say this again. X in the Cartesian system, these three unit vectors, they always point in the direction of the, the three axes. They don't change. Here, uh, in the cylindrical coordinate system, we found that uh, the r hat and the phi hat vectors, the direction of, of those vectors depends on what point you are in space. But the z does not change. In the spherical system, all three of them depend on what point you are in space. So the r hat vector points, you know, points in the direction. Uh, if you have this line going from the the origin to your point in space, 
you continue that line outwards and that, that your r hat vector will point in that direction. In other words, the r hat vector is pointing in the, the radial direction. Okay, and then the azimuth, uh, the a I'm sorry, the zenith angle is the next one. So you imagine drawing in an arc from the z-axis to this point in space and you continue along that arc your theta hat vector will point in that direction. So it's tangent to this circle. So you have a circle going in the vertical direction. And then the azimuth one, you have a circle going in the azimuth direction or the horizontal direction. And your, your phi hat vector is, is tangential to that. All right. Uh, any questions? All right. Um, when, you, when you do some problems of this of this type, it'll become geometries will become more clear. You just have to spend a little bit of time looking at it and understanding it. Uh, all right. So now we can talk about the differential volumes in these Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical systems. So first of all, uh, you can recall that we are using differential edges, surfaces, and volumes when you're performing two-dimensional and three-dimensional in integrals. When you do a three-dimensional integral, you know you have this dx, dy, dz, right? Those are differential lengths, okay? And when you multiply those differential lengths together, you can get differential volumes. So we're going to talk about what that is in Cartesian coordinates because that's, a, that's very simple, but then it becomes more tricky in the uh, cylindrical and spherical coordinate systems. So in the Cartesian coordinates, the differential volume is created by choosing a small range of x, y, and z. Um, and then the lengths of these edges are dx, dy, and zz. And the differential volume is dv equals dx, dy, dz. So let's talk about what these things are. Um, when, we do, uh, <clears throat> when we do integration in three dimensions, we're going to be doing the integration of vector fields as well as scalar fields. So you all might be familiar with this concept that uh, the differential volume is equal to dx, dy, dz. Um, how many of you remember that? Show of hands. Okay, some of you. So some of you, okay, I guess we, we should go over this then. So, well, we are going to be talking about um, doing integration. Actually, yeah, it'll become clear when we do examples of that. So when we do three-dimensional integration, here we go. You know, you may be asked to take uh, an, an integral of integral with respect to volume, uh, a triple integral. And you'll typically break this up into x equals 0 to some number. I'm just making up some things here. y equals 1 to 4, z equals 3 to 5. Making up numbers here. And then say dx, dy, dz. Just to remind yourselves what, what this kind of thing is. So let's get back now and like we'll, we'll talk about what, what this stuff means. Um, when we think about this differential volume in Cartesian coordinates, um, we can think about this cube. Okay, the smallest volume uh, uh, in Cartesian coordinates is when this dx, dy, and dz basically go to zero, and your cube is has no volume in it. Um, but the way that you think about differential volume is that you change one of the parameters. So you have a, a, a change the x from some value to another, you change the y from some value to another, and you change the z from one value to another. You have a ranges. You have ranges of x, ranges of y, ranges of z. And when you take a range of that, you, get, um, you end up getting a volume. Um, so if I were to say... Is it going to be a scalar volume? Or, uh... Oh yeah, it'll be a scalar volume. Absolutely. So if we're trying to trace out a volume in three-dimensional space, what do we do? We, we say we go from x from here to here. All right. So we're, let's say let's go from 0 to a. So we're going to create a volume. x goes from 0 to a. y goes from 0 to b. 
and z goes from 0 to c. All right, so the first thing we do is we, we go from x equals 0 to a. And then from here, we can also stretch, go from y equals 0 to b. All right, so what do we have at this point? We have a two-dimensional space. We have a two-dimensional surface, right? We go from x equals 0 to a, y equals 0 to b. We have this nice two-dimensional surface. Now, if we also say z is equal from 0 to c, so let's say we have this point here. This is at point c. We take this two-dimensional surface and we stretch it out into a third dimension, and what do we get? We get a volume. We get a cube, right? Now, you might be thinking, okay, this is just... This is like high school geometry. Why are we doing this? It's just an important concept. When you, you, have, uh, you stretch out one variable, you get a line. You stretch out two variables, you get a surface. You stretch out three variables, you get a volume. We do the same sort of thing in, um, in, the, in the cylindrical and spherical coordinate system. Uh, before we get into that, let's just uh, look at some definitions here. When we take this differential volume, uh, we're now going to talk about some of the vector calculus aspects that come into it. So you have this cube, and this cube has six sides to it. And three of the sides are shown in this plot here. But right now what we're going to do is define the three differential surfaces that you have. The first differential surface is what we say we denote this dsx in ds differential surface in the x direction okay and what that means is that you take your x unit vector so this is pointing in the direction of the x axis and you take the surface of the cube that is orthogonal or perpendicular to that vector all right so we pick this face of the cube because this is the only face of the cube that is perpendicular to the x axis all right, and we look on the face of that cube, and we say, hey, what's the, um, uh, what is the area of that cube? And then what is the direction of the, uh, of the orthogonal vector? All right, so when we say ds, I'll write this down, ds is equal to a differential surface. All right, you notice that there are three differential surfaces. All right, so this ds is a vector quantity. All right, since I, I can't draw the s in bold, I'm just going to put a little arrow over it just so you know that it's a vector quantity. The differential surface, as a vector quantity, it has magnitude and direction. So the magnitude, the magnitude is equal to the area of the surface. And the direction is uh, orthogonal to the surface. All right, this is an important concept. I mean, maybe I should just have, a, have had a different slide for this. But this is a very important concept. What is a differential surface? It's a vector quantity. Vector quantity. It has magnitude and direction. The magnitude is equal to the area of the surface. The direction is orthogonal to the surface. So let's look at this example here. All right, here's our, our differential surface vector. It points... Notice the direction here. The direction is orthogonal to the surface. The x hat vector is pointing orthogonal to the surface, so there's a unit vector here. And what is the area? Well, we take, what do we take the area of this, uh, this surface here? This is dz, and, and this here is dy. So this length multiplied by this length here. That's the area of, of that cube, or the area of that it could be a rectangle, but length times the width. All right, 
So that is the dy dz here. That's the area. All right, and there's similarly, there's three differential surfaces. There's one in the x hat direction, there's one in the y hat direction, and there's one in the z hat direction. But you notice how these are different. The, the one in the x, um, the x direction is the area is dy dz. The area here is dx dz. And the area up here is dx dy. Right, that concept of a differential surface is very important. All right, let's do the same thing in cylindrical coordinates. So in cylindrical coordinates, we're going to create a small differential volume by choosing a small range of r, phi, and z. And then you have the, the lengths of these edges. Uh, and they turn out to be slightly different than, uh, than the, uh, the Cartesian coordinate system. So I'm actually going to start from a blank graph and kind of work, work that out with you. All right, we're going to draw this out again. This is the x, y, and z directions. Now let's imagine that you have, um, we're going to draw a point in space like this, let's say. All right, this is the distance to the z axis, so this is your r. Draw the R here as well. This is your angle phi. And then this is your distance z up here. Okay, so we're at this point in space here. All right, so let's talk about the differential volume first. So if we pick a range of r, let's say we pick a range of r, we go in this direction, okay? We're picking a range of r. All right, does everyone see that there's a little arc here? Oh, shoot, did I do that right? <laughs> My bad. Range of R would be in this direction. So let's let's go out like this. Let's continue out further. So we're going from between R1 and R2. So let's say this is R1 and this is R2. All right. So if we take a range of one variable, we get a line, right? So we have this line. Now now we're going to take the range of two variables. We're also going to take a range of phi 1 and phi 2. So um, this is equal to phi 1, let's say. And then let's say this, and we're going to call another one phi 2. And that's out, out here. So I'm going to say this is r2. And so I'm going to, let's say phi 2 goes all the way to the y-axis, so just for kicks. All right, so this is, R, um, this is R1, R2. Um, phi 1, we're going to go all the way to phi 2, like this. OK, so we are picking a range of phi. All right, and we're also, that range of phi is also going from this R1 vector. So now we've traced out a two-dimensional surface like this. Okay, does everyone see this? I know it's a little bit, a little bit tricky to see. If it helps, I can draw out a two-dimensional version of it. So, um, yeah. We draw out a two-dimensional version, you think x and y. So what we're doing here is we are going from r1 to r2. So there's a range of r here. All 
All right, and we're also going from phi 1 to phi 2. Let's say that's phi 1, and then this is phi 2. So imagine the imagine this tracing out an arc like this. All right, so this is r1, r2, and then you have your phi 1 and phi 2. You see how this traces out? It traces out like an annulus. We call that an annulus. In the Cartesian coordinate system, what do we do? Just so you have this sense, you can draw this comparison. We, we created a range of x, and that gave us a line. We created a range of y, and that created a two-dimensional surface, and that two-dimensional surface looked like a rectangle or a cube. All right, and then we brought it out in the third dimension. We got, uh, we got the cube. Um, sorry, I should say like it looks like a square or a rectangle in two dimensions. We, we spread it out in three dimensions and it looks like a cube or some kind of prism. All right, we do the same thing in the cylindrical coordinate system. We go from a range of R1 to R2. We have a line there. Then we go, we also trace out um, phi1 to phi2. We end up getting, we also get a, a two dimensional space. We get a surface, but that surface now looks like an annulus instead of a cube or a rectangle, instead of a square or a rectangle. Now what's going to happen if we take this in the third dimension? It'll be like a portion of an annulus that's sort of stretched out in the z-axis, right? And we'll, you'll get a volume. And so you can picture what that volume sort of looks like. Okay, so that's what's, if we do that here in my in my terrible drawing, you will see that you know, if we sort of tried drawing this out like this with different uh, versions of different values of z, we're going to end up getting a volume that looks like kind of like a, a wedge, I suppose. All right, that's a really terrible drawing, but that's the, the nicer drawing that you see that you see here. All right, you took a range of r, a range of phi, and a range of z, and you get a nice um, you get a differential volume, except this differential volume is not a cube anymore. It looks more, it's, it has cylindrical symmetry. So you can think about this as a cylindrical wedge. All right, now we look at each one of these, uh, the three surfaces. Just like we did in the x, y, uh, and z coordinate system, we're going to do the same thing for the cylindrical coordinate system, and we're going to look at the, the differential surfaces. We have the differential volume already. We have to look at the differential surfaces. Oh, no, 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 we don't have the differential volume already. There's a very important difference between these three. So um, I will go back to my simple two-dimensional drawing here so that you can see this. All right, how do we find the area of this surface? Okay. Uh, without integration, let's just let's think about um, pi r squared minus pi r squared. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Times the angle cosine of the Okay, we're on the we're on the right track here. I just want to think about this really simply, right? If um, let's. Uh, uh, here, let's let's do a simpler problem first. What's the what's the area of this? Let's say this is r uh, r two. What is the area of this? Two pi over r. So we could take the uh, we could take the, we could take the area of the entire circle, right, and just multiply it by pi r squared times one fourth, right? That's one way of doing it. Um, but that this is actually not how we think about doing things in when we when we work in differential coordinates. 
here's here's something that's a little bit confusing. If you if you remember this from multivariable calculus, that's great. If you don't, that's okay. We're going to talk talk about like a little bit of mathematical trick that you may or may not know. What we what we kind of do here is we approximate we approximate this wedge shape into something that looks something like this. We're going to kind of take that wedge shape and um, we're going to say it kind of like looks kind of like a rectangle, okay? Why do we do that? We do that because this um, allows us to find the area in a very simple way. We just find this distance here and this distance across here. All right, but here's, there's an important, uh, important thing here, and this is the main thing I want to point out. Um, so this is going from R1 to R2, right? So we agree that what's the distance here going to be? So R2 minus R1. R2 minus R1. Okay. Now what is the distance here going to be? This is where the, the cylindrical coordinates actually comes into play. Is is it just is this just phi two minus phi one? This is this is a really important point. Is it phi two minus phi one? No. Why? Is phi is an angle, right? It's not an actual distance, right? Like we we can't say that the distance here is just like it's the distance is five degrees. We need something in like actual distance units, right? Do you guys remember the concept of arc length? Mm -hmm. It's the arc length. Okay? Yeah, so that's why I'm, I'm really emphasizing this. So the arc length here, arc length, this is equal to the radius times phi 2 minus phi 1. Okay? All right, if you guys are wondering why that's the case, I'll just do a quick thing for you here. All right, we talked about a fractional, you know, we reminded ourselves that a fraction of a circle has a certain thing, uh, has a certain area associated with it. If I want to find the arc length from here to here, I'm going to find the arc length from this point to this point. What is the arc length? All right, um, if you were to find it in a similar way, how, how can we go about finding arc length? Circumference times the yeah. ratio of, of the angle. Exactly, exactly. So let's figure this out. Let's say this is, um, let's say this is phi 1 and then this is phi 2. So the way we find the arc length is, well, let's let's start out with the simpler problem first. You say this is equal to phi. All right, so the, the arc length, this is equal to um, the circumference times the, um, the ratio, which is, phi over 2 pi, right? 2 pi would be the entire circumference. Phi over 2 pi is a portion of the circumference. So the circumference is equal to, what's the formula for circumference? 2 pi r, 2 pi r times phi over 2 pi. 2 pi's cancel, and you're left with r times phi. Arc length is equal to r times the angle. All right. Now, if you were to take the same example, if you were to take a, a similar kind of thing where you go from phi 1 to phi 2, so if you're trying to find this arc length here, it turns out that the arc length will be, by similar math, it's going to be equal to r times phi 2 minus phi 1. All right? Why 
is it not like 90 degree minus 2 R1? Um, if, if you do the math here, you, you'll, you'll see. It, it, this is what it comes down to. So R2 is like 90 degree or just that angle? Oh, I just picked an arbitrary angle phi 2 here. I mean, it could be 90 degrees. It doesn't have to be 90 degrees. Okay, okay. So that's the R2 like the whole thing, not, not the, the, in the middle, right? Uh, th this one here? Oh, yeah. Well, th this is the same R. Let's say you have two points here, and, and what you're trying to measure is the arc length of this. If you're trying to calculate the arc length of this, the arc length turns out to be the radius, which is your R, times phi 2 minus phi 1. Okay? So getting back to this, you know, we're trying to find the volume of this differential element. And the Cartesian coordinate system is very simple. It's just dx, dy, dz. That's your differential volume. In this coordinate system, you actually have to find, you first find the area of this, uh, of this thing. And I said that the, the shortcut that mathematicians use when they're doing three-dimensional um, uh, integrations, they, they take this wedge-shaped thing and they approximate it to be a... Um, uh, uh, a rectangle like this. The arc length of this rectangle is r times phi 2 minus phi 1, and this is r2 minus r1. So where do, what does this come out to? This is what we say dr, the change in r. All right, and the arc length we say is equal to r times d phi, the change in phi, right? All right, and if we want to, if this is in three dimensions, we have to take the z dimension into account. The z dimension, it turns out to be, it's, it's straightforward. It's just like the, the um, uh, just like the Cartesian coordinate system. So as a result of that, our differential volume in a cylindrical coordinate system, this differential volume is equal to r dr d phi dz all right so you have the, the the difference in r that's one that's one of the dimensions then the next one is r d phi right because we to find the arc length we had to multiply r times d phi so that's where these two terms come from and then the dz just comes from the the movement in the z direction so the the volume of that differential element is r dr d phi dz and that is where, um, that is why you see this thing here. dv is equal to r dr d phi dz. Questions? Totally okay if you have questions, you want to go over something else. Okay? All right, let's look at our differential surfaces then. Um, rather than me trying to draw it out, which which is always great fun, um, I think what I'll do is, well, if I can write on this, that would be nice. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna point at this. All right, let's try to figure out our differential surfaces. We'll start with this one here. Okay, there's three unit vectors, and we find the differential surfaces for each one of them. So the first surface, it points in the, um, in the r hat direction. And we're trying to find the, the surface, this surface here. What is the area of this surface? OK? All right, in order to find the area of the surface, we multiply the length times the width. All right, we're going to treat these surfaces, even though they're curved surfaces, we are going to treat them like they are just plain old rectangles. OK? That's the trick. All right, so um, let's start with the, this surface here. What is the, uh, the, this length here? Right, this is dz, correct? And then the more tricky one, what is this length here? R d phi, right? Because this is an arc length. This is going around, this, this line is going around the circle, right? Whenever the line's going around the circle, you think about this as an arc length. And so you have your dz here, and then your r d phi here. Okay, remember, 
the differential surface vector, it has magnitude and direction. The magnitude is equal to the area of the surface, so the area is the length times the width, so this is dz, and this one is r d phi. Multiply those two together, you get the area. So this is the area. It also has direction. The direction points orthogonal to the surface. And so the r hat vector, the r hat unit vector, points orthogonal to the surface. All right, so that is your ds differential surface vector in this direction. Um, uh, how about in the z direction? Okay, you notice that it's pointed uh, up in the z hat direction, so you have your direction there. Now the area, so we're going to take the area of this thing, we're going to think about this as kind of like a rectangle. So you have the length and the width. So this is the length. The length is equal to r d phi, right? It's an arc length. And then dr is the, um, the length here. Does that make sense? See some knots? Okay, good. So there you go, r, d, r, d, phi in that direction. All right, the last one, or remember that this tangent vector, the phi hat vector, this points in this direction, okay? It points tangent, the phi hat vector always points tangent to the circle. So the, the surface that is perpendicular to that vector looks like this side of the wedge. And if we would just want to find the area of this side of the wedge, dr is the length here, of this line here, and the length of this line, what is the length of this line? dz. Right, so you have your dr and your dz points in the phi hat direction there. Right. These surface, uh, surfaces are going to become very important when we do our uh, surface integrals. That's why I'm spending so much time on this. So um, the best thing for you all to do is to go over this stuff uh, on your own, um, draw these things out on your own, and figure out, you know, try to derive them yourselves. What, are the, what is the area of each one of those surfaces? What are the vectors that point orthogonally to it? And it'll make sense to you. All right, but that arc length thing is is the um, the tricky thing that that I feel like is not explained always that well in mathematics books. All right, so now we're going to do the spherical coordinates. I think we'll have yeah, you know, we have enough time. So twenty minutes to cover that. Um, the differential volume in spherical coordinates. We're um, here. The differential volume is a wedge, and it's formed by sweeping each of the three variables over a small range. And the lengths of the edges we're going to find out is uh, dr and then r d theta and then r sine theta d phi. Those are going to be the, the differential lengths of the edges. And the differential volume is going to look like this. So let's go over um, that same process with a spherical coordinate system. So um, let me go down here. All right, so we start out with a point in three-dimensional space. And remember, in the spherical coordinate system, we have r, and then we have theta, and we have phi. This is theta. And if we were to come down here, this. This would be um, phi here, like this. Okay, that's a simple way to think about it. You can also think about phi in terms of the circle that I drew up here on the previous slide, but either one, they're both equivalent. All right, so theta is this angle here, and phi is this angle here. Now what we're going to do, just like we did in the X, uh, in the Cartesian and the uh, cylindrical system, we're going to take a range of these things. So you think about taking a range of theta. So if you take a range of theta, you, know, you imagine that it changes your angle like this. So just take a range of from theta 1 to theta 2. You're going to get a line like this. Okay, now you take a range of phi. 
So I'll draw this in green again, just so you all remember from before. Phi goes out in this direction. So we take a range of phi that way. So at this point, we have a range of theta and a range of phi, and so we get this surface like this. We get a surface that looks like this. All right, and if we, if we also take a range of r, then that surface turns into a three-dimensional volume that looks sort of like this. Okay, and that is the three-dimensional volume that you see in, um, uh, in the previous slide, in the main slide in the notes. Okay? So we are going to take this one and draw this... Try to draw this out like this. You all can see the different parts here. And we'll just do this little exercise here. All right, so we have a spherical wedge like this. Spherical. Yes, we have two arc lengths now. Exactly, you got it. So, um, the, let's start with the easy dimension first. We have three lengths here that we're stretching out. Okay, when we when we stretch out r, we go from r one to r two. The length. So this is the coordinate. When we stretch out that coordinate, we get a length, the corresponding length, dr. All right, so the length of this edge is dr. And that's the easy one. All right, now the next one, we have to look at the length of, of this edge here. Okay, and as we said before, that is, that is an arc length. Okay, just like before, this is equal to, this length is equal to r d phi. R D theta, thank you. Yeah, I always see, I always mix the two up. R D theta. Okay, so if you want to figure out the area of this side, you know, you just multiply these two together. But I'm just gonna put the edge lengths in here because the edge lengths are really what you want to remember in your head. So then there's this line down here, right? This line down here, the one that I'm gonna draw in bold here again. So it turns out that the length of this edge is equal to r sine of theta d phi. Why is that? Sort of a rhetorical question. <laughs> I'll show you a little bit of an example of why, you know, why that's the case. You need the radius and the theta. Why is that? Because you're taking that and stretching it at small increments of d phi. Okay, you're stretching. Yeah, that's where this comes from. The, the small increments of d phi, that's why you have this. So, um, you know, we're spending a lot of time on this, but I think this is, this is always something, this fundamental thing that always like ends up tripping, tripping people up. So, we've established that arc length 
arc length is the radius of the circle times phi 2 minus phi 1, right? Cover that. Arc length is the radius of the circle times the difference in angle, okay? So here's the thing. In the spherical system, the, the radius actually depends on where what your zenith, zenith angle is. So for example, if I was, if um, I, I, you see this green circle I've drawn here? All right, this is the circle that we're going to be using for calculating the arc length here. All right, what's the radius of the circle? Can you see it's not equal to the radius of the sphere? All right, let me, let me prove that to you. What's the radius here? So let's, let's, just, let's just call this by a different variable. Let's call this A, okay? What's the radius of this circle? We know that this is R, so let's put this R. We know that this is the radius of the sphere. Ah, I, I shouldn't put that capital. Let's just, here, there you go. This is the radius of the point that we're at, okay? So this is R. So the radius of the sphere is equal to R. Can I keep on putting capital R? I don't want to confuse you. So what is the A equal to? Use your geometry. No. So this is, we have this angle here. Think about this as a triangle, okay? Here's your triangle. So your hypotenuse is your R, and this is one of the legs of the triangle. This A is equal to R, R sine theta. Okay, sine of theta is r over this leg here, and you multiply that by r, you get this, this length is equal to a. This length a. All right? So that is why, you know, the, the formula for arc length is the same as before. This is the radius of the circle. The radius of the circle is a here, and you're multi multiplying it by the change in, um, change in angle. Does that make sense? All right, let me say let me state this again a different way. So so it, it makes sense to you. When we did this when we did this thing in um, cylindrical coordinates, what did we find? We find that uh, like we want to find the area of this uh, area of this wedge and we said that, that this this length is dr and this length is is the arc length. So we had a simple way of figuring out the arc length. The arc length is equal to the radius times the change in angle. The radius of the circle times the change in angle. Now the unique thing in spherical coordinates is that the radius of the circle actually depends on what your theta angle is, believe it or not. So graphically if I show that, if, let me draw this in blue here. All right, so let's say this is this is uh, theta. Let's say I have a different angle as theta. Let's say another theta that I choose is way down here. So I have another theta that's like this. So now my angle, my the circle that I'm going to be looking at is this big. You see how these two circles have different sizes? So that's why we can't just use we can't just use r d phi here. We actually have to include this r sine theta d phi. Yeah. Um, is R in the case of the cylindrical and the polar representation, is that the length from the origin to the closest point? So it, the question regarding notation. Um, different books use different things, and um, I, you know, I just use lowercase r, and if I'm, if I'm in the cylindrical coordinate system, 
it's, it refers to uh, uh, the distance to the z-axis. And if I'm in the spherical coordinate system, it refers to the distance to the origin. Okay, but the closest point from the origin of the z-axis, right? Yeah, the closest distance to the origin are the z-axis. That's right. Now, the, a lot of textbooks, in order to differentiate the two and make sure there's no confusion, they'll say capital R. They'll say capital R in spherical coordinates. So capital R refers to the distance to the origin. Lowercase r refers to, as the distance to the z-axis. So I, um, you know, just and just for my own ease, I, I sometimes just use lowercase r. But if, if that's confusing to everyone, I, I'm, I can, you know, I can change it. But my, my suggestion is to you is just know what coordinate system you're in and use the variables for that coordinate system. Um, all right, so are there any questions here? For the R points, mm -hmm. uh, when we get like the area of the mm -hmm. 2D surface mm -hmm. with the arc length trick, is that an approximation or is that an exact value? Um, is the arc length, is it a, is it a good, um, is it accurate or is it just an approximation? To get the surface area. Yeah, to get the surface area. It is an approximation, but it turns out that it becomes very accurate when those arc lengths become small. See, the thing is, like, he, this is the trick that mathematicians do. Like, they, we know, this is a great example. We know that the area of this is not just equal. This you can, It's not the same as a rectangle, right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, when that when the drs become very small and when the theta d thetas become very small, it becomes a very good approximation to that rectangle. And whenever we do integration, whenever we do three dimensional, three, two dimensional, three dimensional integration, um, those differential volumes we're adding them up and we're taking the limit as those differential volumes go to zero. That is like one of the fundamental concepts of calculus in Riemann sums, uh, is that you take the limit as those the, the drs and the d thetas become really, 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 really tiny. And then you can use these little approximations, and all of calculus is really based on that. Okay, so... Um, you know, I think as as a um, as an exercise at home, uh, in order to make sure that you understand this stuff, what I suggest is that you go over the spherical coordinate system and just draw out um, draw out what the the differential surfaces are going to be in the spherical coordinate system. The differential surfaces, just like we did with for the last two coordinate systems, and see if your estimates actually match up with with the with the answers that you'll see here. Okay. All right, so that brings us to this slide here. This is a, uh, um, a tabular summary of everything that we've talked about um, and more. Uh, Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical coordinate systems. Um, we talked a lot today about the differential lengths. You know, the differential lengths was uh, um, uh, in, in the Cartesian coordinate system, it was x hat dx plus y hat dy plus z hat dz. So these were the lengths. We talked about the differential surface areas on the three surfaces of the cube. And those are the three that you see here. We talked about the differential volume. Um, these are the differential surfaces and differential volumes in cylindrical coordinates. And this is what I just asked you to do, is that figure out on your own, draw it out, and figure out what the differential surfaces are in spherical coordinates and see if it matches up with um, what what you expect. Okay, I think just for the sake of completeness, let's just do the differential volume real quick, just to finish up our discussion on that. We were talking about this, um, the, uh, the three lengths of the edges of this little wedge here. So the dv, ooh, Um, the differential volume is going to be equal to the, the just the, the product of these three, so dr 
times r d theta times r sine theta d phi. Multiply those three together. And then we put the r's together, so you end up getting r squared d, oops. So you get r squared sine of theta dr d theta d phi. Right? And that's what you that's what you see here on this chart. R squared sine theta dr d theta d phi. I would like you to do the same for these differential surfaces. It'll really hammer in the points here. Okay? Now um, the next thing you are going to need for your homeworks that are due Wednesday is um, you don't need to do the coordinate transformations. We'll talk about that later. This is the way that you transform from one coordinate system uh, into another. You can transfer the coordinate variables from one system to the other. Um, you can transfer the unit vectors from one system to the other. You can transfer vectors from one system to the other. Now what you're going to need from your homework is this chart of gradient, divergence, curl, and then the Laplacian operator. You're going to need to know how to do the, uh, the curl in, um, in a different coordinate system, right? The last two problems on your homework, you're going to be using this chart to figure out the divergence and curl of some vector fields in the cylindrical and spherical coordinate systems. So just look at this um, to keep in mind that the curl operator, the, the formula for curl in the Cartesian system is not the same as the formula for curl in the cylindrical and spherical systems. And um, the way that I recommend is just by um, using this chart. We are not going to do the derivations of curl and divergence in cylindrical and spherical systems in the interest of time. I just want you to use the formulas that are in here. Okay? Um, if you have any questions on the homework between now and Wednesday, please uh, let me know. Uh, if you follow this, uh, this chart, uh, you'll be able to calculate them, uh, hopefully without any issue. All right? Um, any other questions before we go? Okay, great.